Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jorge Miranda Pinto. Nothing's there, sorry. I was trying to, I typically use the, the iPad. And Apple TV didn't work this time. I tried so many times. But we can, we don't need the iPad so much. So why I like the iPad? Because I can write down equations and all it's gonna be right there for you. I can write draw graphs and all that. But today is not super necessary. I will use the board if it's useful. But in the future, this has to work, okay? <clears throat> well, again, uh, welcome to Econ 7040. I'm Jorge Miranda Pinto. I'm from Chile, South America. The way you say is Jorge, like H H. If you cannot do Jorge, you say Jorge. But I'm not George, okay? <laughs> South Americans. Any South America? One. <laughs> no, we're two. Okay, so um, good. Today is introductory. Okay, uh, we'll have some uh, introduction about why, what we're going to do, basically. Also, why I'm here. Uh, so this is that's this is not the first time. It's the second time I teach Econ 740. I did change the slides, except that thing. Uh, the consultation hours are right, Thursday from 4 to 5 p.m. I'm in Colin Clark Building, which is Building 39. Um, but if you cannot, at that time, uh, Friday mornings, at the end of the morning, typically also, also work. We can work that out. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I won't bore you with my story. i just tell you what I do now. So. Uh, for the ones that are, that are interested in research or do some thesis in the future, uh, what I do, I, I, I do macroeconomics, MA, macroeconomics. The Australians don't understand when I, when I say macro, they think I mean micro, but MA, macroeconomics. Uh, in a, from a perspective, from a microeconomic perspective, like why microeconomic heterogeneity is important, from two perspectives, from the firm size perspective, uh, whether firm heterogeneity is important for the propagation and amplification of shocks. In my research, I find that yes, uh, that's important. Uh, and in that heterogeneity at the firm level, uh, uh, networks are also involved there. Not a super fancy way of analyzing networks, it's uh, just an exogenous network that I just calibrate to the input output tables in the data, but still, uh, it's an interesting area. The other is the role of households heterogeneity. The fact that, uh, say, half of you are uh, very rich, but half of you are very indebted. So you, uh, you had to, to get a lot of loans uh, to get to this point somehow. And the behavior of the credit constraints versus the non-credit constraints is super different, but in, in this literature, what I add is the literature of the saving constraints. Uh, which is like the low wealth people that is indebted, but behaves rather different than the credit constraint. A credit constraint would just consume whatever he got or she has, like extra income. But a saving constraint is different. It's somebody that wanted to uh, sustain certain level of consumption. So you wanted to live in that house, you wanted to live in that, uh, you wanted to have that car, put your kids in that uh, school, so you, 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 you got a, you, t you took on debt, and then when you receive extra income, what do you do? You pay that debt, so you deleverage. So, and that's rather different from somebody that is credit constrained that just spends that extra money. And that is super important for the transmission of fiscal shocks in particular. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in all those uh, type of uh, um, interactions between microeconomic heterogeneity and macro macroeconomics. Potentially at the end of the course, we'll discuss a little bit about the first topic. And indeed, uh, uh, last year, uh, like one year from now, one of the students that was seated in, like you, a student of mine, we actually worked on a project together on that first topic, and we finished, uh, we extended his thesis, and we finished that paper, and we submitted it to a, to a very decent journal. So. Um, I'm very open, guys, if, if you want to do research and thesis. Uh, okay, so the tutors 
Our two former students that are very good, I think you will like them, uh, Jose Alexander Suazon Gloria and Jin Wu. So Jose and Jin. They, 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 they have consultations on Mondays and both on Mondays, basically. You can see that. And the place, uh, the place um, uh, I think, is in the building 39, room 1, but we have to double check that. They can uh, double check that. Okay, so before we move on, I would like to know a little bit more about you guys. Uh, first of all, how many of you uh, like macroeconomics, MA? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that's not bad, eight. And how many of you, uh, this is the first macroeconomic course. How many of you, this is the first macro course? The first macro course. How many of you is taking this as a second macro course? The second macro course. The third macro course. Okay. Uh, uh? And the, the ones that took the third macro course, the two, the two previous ones were taken here at UQ? Yes, most of you. Okay. Um, who would like to pursue a PhD in economics, potentially? One, two, three, four. That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay, so potential thesis. Um, who would like to work in a central bank or in a... Are you overlap? You also want a PhD? No, no. But central bank, yeah, you can certainly do that. Okay. Um, Interesting. So uh, they will have a, we will have an RBA, uh, you know, the Research Bank of Australia guest lecture at some point. They will come here. They will give you a guest lecture in topics that are related to our lecture. And we might do something interesting. I, I'm not sure it's in the, on the syllabus, but my idea was to select the best projects in the empirical part. We'll talk about that project later. And then make those people present especially the ones that are interested in working there because that would be a nice opportunity for employability in the future. So if you're interested, uh, we can talk about that. So that would be easier for the RBA to screen good students or people that is interested in, in working there. Okay. What else? Any Australian? Um, from UK? From France, no World Cup champion. Okay, so now let's go uh, to the boring part, which is uh, the course. The, the first part of this course is about long-term uh, macro, uh, which is just economic growth. Uh, the, the ones that already had three courses, I'm pretty sure you already uh, studied the solo growth models. Or, uh, yes, that. I don't think you study already endogenous growth model, potentially not. So in this course, we will study theory and data or evidence uh, to understand why, uh, why uh, Filipinas is, is, is not as rich as the U.S. or why Chile is not as rich as, uh, as Australia, etc. Okay, we'll try to understand that from a theoretical and from an empirical point of view. The good thing of the iPad is that I don't have to be moving all the time there, I, just with the iPad to this. So the second part of the course is about business cycle fluctuations, which is which I'm uh, my research topic, but also I'm interested in the first one. And this is to understand short-term macroeconomic fluctuations. Why uh, why we were in a recession? Why the recession lasted so so long? What are the main drivers of microeconomic fluctuations? And in this second part, uh, we, uh, with a former master's, master's student that took this course last year, we studied part two, like business cycle fluctuations in Australia. So we, we studied like the granularity hypothesis, and we found out that not only energy or mining sector uh, firms that are very large are drivers of GDP in Australia, but also Qantas or, or West Farmers, uh, or our construction companies that are relatively large, whatever happens to them also affects the GDP quite quite a lot. 
and, and, and things that, that, that affected them, that affected them GDPs, like changes in CEOs or, or natural disasters in a mine or, or something like that. So that's going to be uh, potentially at the end of the course we discuss to discuss more about that. Okay, so I need to acknowledge that, I mean, this is the second time teaching this course. Last time wasn't super organized because along the way it was changing some things, but now it should be pretty much organized. And besides the lecture slides and the tutorial material, the main uh, learning resource will be that book called Intermediate Macroeconomics from Garin, Lester, and Sims. It's an online resource. That is the main book. It's called Intermediate, but it's used to teach introductory, intermediate, and advanced macro because it's super wide in, in, in terms of what it covers. And let me just right away uh, do here. Um, a, um, one of the authors is uh, Julio Garin. He's uh, from Uruguay. He's a very good economist. We are the first, uh, you're the first students using this book in Australia. In the US, it's very, um, very famous now, textbook. And the, the reason I like it is because it, it all the time makes compete uh, the, the neoclassical way of looking at the world and the, and the new Keynesian way of looking at the world. It, it doesn't just pick one. It's, it's very, uh, I would say, an open-minded, book, oh, here, there. So you can find the, the, the most upda updated version of the manuscript is right there. So I pressed, oh, it's coming. Just for you uh, to know, so that's the main, okay? So there will be like 10 lectures, nine lectures will be based on, eight lectures will be based on this. One lecture will be based on uh, the other book, which is, uh, I will tell you later the details, and the other lecture will be based on papers, essentially. So this is the book, Intermediate Macro, Julio Garin, Robert Lester, and Eric Sims. It's completely free for you online, and I, I really like it. So uh, one of the feedback from last year is that this book is good, so I, I will keep it. Okay, so it's, the link should be in the, in the ECP. The ECP uh, should have the link. Okay, so the, the other book that we'll use as well is uh, Advanced Macroeconomics by David Romer. He's not Paul Romer, the Nobel Prize, he's David Romer. And this will be used for lecture four, essentially, for uh, uh, endogenous growth models, okay? And then, I also like to, uh, discuss uh, news or blogs, entries by some economists. So sometimes, for example, next lecture I will tell you, if we have time, this is the, the, the blog that I want you to read, so we discuss it at the end of the lecture. Uh, the, who has Twitter account? Okay. So I, I, I also like uh, Twitter a lot. The, there are very interesting discussions there between economies, uh, typically New Keynesian against Neoclassical, and it's super interesting. So sometimes I may bring some screenshots and we might talk about that. The assessments. There is a mid-semester exam. It's 35% of this course in class on April the 5th. Okay, so the, 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 the exam will cover material from lecture one to four which means we'll cover uh, solo growth model, extended solo growth model, and endogenous growth model. You will have those topics. And there will be some MCQs, there will be a short answer and a problem solving, potentially some short essay. And here, the, the, the news and the blog discussion that we will have al along the way might be there. I won't surprise you with any news that you were not uh, uh, told, but say we discuss some news in, in, in lecture three, then that might appear in the, in, in the test like very simple questions to make sure you understand, understood the main point. And here's where I want to spend a little bit uh, more time because uh, uh, there, here there, is, there are some innovations. The project 
is 30% of the course, and it's divided in two parts. In part one, which is 10% 10, 10 of the course, part one is, will, is due on tutorials. Uh, the week of the April, April 8 to, to 12. Uh, so, some people email me already uh, because this is a group project. So it would be groups, four, five people, sometimes three people. And I assign already the groups in, uh, on Blackboard, but given that it's very likely that some new students arrive, although it's more likely that students leave, uh, then I will update that very soon, okay? Uh, so um, please hang, hang there. And, and this is the innovation because last year what we had was a long essay and had a lot of troubles with people trying to, to write the essay and try to understand what was the idea. So now I'm going to do something uh, that should help you more and it should make this uh, more fun. And what is this? This is like a play role. Uh, you will have a group, and each group will be a team of economists in a given institution, in the IMF or in the World Bank or in the Research Bank of Australia. And the group will have to uh, analyze some program or, or some reform that that institution implemented or helped um, designing in the past in a given country at a certain point of time. Using a, a economic intuition, being just a coherent analysis plus some economic evidence in the last decades or years, you will defend your point and you will go to tutorials and you will present a very short presentation, one minute each member, and you will convince me and the tutor that we should change or we should uh, modify the reform or the program you're analyzing, or we should put one completely new in place in order to improve medium-term, long-term economic uh, conditions of a given country, of a given. What I want the most from this is not necessarily that you come up with a, I mean, the best reform. What I want you is to discuss, to critically discuss, and develop soft skills, because soft skills are very important out there when you go on the job market to try to find a job. It's not just about Excel or Stata or that analysis. It's also very important that you're able to uh, convince somebody from, uh, with the argument that you have, with what you think. So in the extreme case, if, the, if there are like one to 10 points and you're so good arguing and, and, and with your soft skills that you convince me of something that is completely wrong, I will still value that. So it's gonna be like, a trade-off between how you develop the presentation skills and also the coherence consistency of the arguments. Uh, so the, the details of that part of the project are here in this document, uh, actually in the next slide. Uh, just give me uh, two more minutes to talk about a bit more on that and see if you have questions. Oh, uh, one thing that is important. In the, the week before this is due, lecture five, we'll have a training here. Rather than a typical lecture, we'll have a training here. Everyone comes, you put in the groups, you start discussing because you're already at that point, you know what institution you are, you already know, should know what reform or program you're analyzing, we're gonna see examples later, and we will discuss. I mean, I'll give you some time to discuss, to argue, then I'm gonna to talk to some groups, the tutors might come, it's gonna be more interactive uh, session, not just me talking, okay? And that should prepare you for what you will have in the, in the next week or so. And this, uh, that's a typo, the part two should be 20%. That, that's not 30%, sorry, that's, they should add up 30, so that's a 20%, and that's due in May 9th, my mom's birthday. And that will cover materials mainly from lecture five, uh, and lecture five will be this training session. So what we do, what, what I will do in order to have this training session, I will apply which is called blended learning. Have you heard that? So blended learning, the way I will use it is that I will post in two or three weeks, the lecture five that I gave last year. 
I will take off all the bad jokes, all the, the bad things, pronunciation, all that. I will post that. And that has to be, um, that lecture is very important for the second part because in that lecture I go over and analyze, study two or three papers that do empirical work on uh, growth and uh, economic growth. And the, and the project part two is essentially extending, replicating those papers. It's like collecting data, cross-country data on GDP per capita, on uh, quality of institutions, on, on the share of uh, mining in the economy, the service share, or, or education attainment. Different variables that you will play around and you will try to tell me, uh, Jorge, this is the most important driver of economic growth. Or, or in this group of country, we observe conditional convergence, uh, uh, etc. So applying topics that we learn in the theory in the first four lectures, in the project part two, you will um, empirically uh, work on that. You will need Excel, and um, you could also use, uh, use this data if you like to. But it will be flexible if some of you never knew uh, or cover anything about statistic or econometrics, I will be flexible on that. But ideally, you can at least analyze correlations and patterns in the data. Okay? And this must be submitted electronically in Blackboard. And turn it in in Blackboard. And turn it in, you submit the final report. And in Blackboard, you submit the replication files. Okay? Do you know what I mean by replication files? It's like the Excel or this data uh, are uh, files that you use in order to arrive to your graphs and tables and conclusions. And there will be a final exam that will cover the part two of the course, which is the business cycles uh, short-term fluctuations. And that's lecture six to 10. So the RBA, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia guest lecture will also uh, will, will be part also of this uh, exam. And for you, uh, so this is in, or, in order to help you prepare better the exam and the mid-semester uh, mid -semester exam, I will provide the mock exams. Uh, not necessarily the previous year exams, but some, some exams that are similar. I will give you a week so you work on that and then two or three days before the, the, um, the actual exam, I will give you some proposed solutions. Not su super, super detailed, but some guidance on how you should solve and answer those questions, okay? Uh, do you have questions? Okay, so this is, this is part one of the project a little bit more in detail. This is in, I posted this on Blackboard. Okay. Okay, so each team, as I said, this is part one of the project, each team will be a team of economists working, working at any of the suggested institutions. Uh, I will assign the institution unless you have a strong preference for the institution, okay? If you wanna be in the IMF as a group and you want, really want it, okay, that's fine. But the groups are gonna be assigned. So when you get a job, when you go out there, you will be assigned to some team, right? So you need to uh, develop those skills, teamwork and all that. Uh, so each institution has different roles, they do different things for the world economy or for some particular countries. So then you will go to their website and choose one program or reform that this institution implemented, designed or helped uh, in the implementation. And you will analyze, criticize this, and then you will propose either a completely different reformer program or some modifications based on some evidence that might be suggestive, narrative evidence, or ideally some 
just few graphs showing some empirical evidence in order to support your point. So you will use economic intuition. You can actually choose papers. You say, I mean, this reform was implemented in this country in this given year, and there is a paper that studied that. So that's why I think this, this, and this. So it's, it's basically what economists do in these institutions. So for example, that what I used to do when I worked in Chile in the Minister of Labor and Minister of Finance, I worked uh, uh, and a little bit also in the Central Bank, was part of the meetings where you had to convince and anal analyze certain reforms, use some econometric methods, potentially some model out there, uh, and that was the idea. So each group has to prepare a short report describing, uh, analyzing and describing what they propose and this report must be submitting, submitted uh, 24 hours before the presentation. The presentation varies according to your tutorial. I mean, each group has one to, uh, the tutorial of the week uh, in April 8 to 12, I said. Say you have tutorials on, on, on Thursday, then on Wednesday, 24 hours before, you, sub, you, you submit the, the report. And each group will have five, uh, four to five minute presentation where each member gets to speak at least one minute. And as I said, the group will be evaluated by the instructor and tutors based on the economic coherence of the analysis, as well as based on the quality of the presentation, presentation skills. Okay? So here are some examples that I give in this document. You have the World Bank. This is a website and a program of reform that the World Bank uh, implemented in Malaysia in year 1999. Potentially, you will find that they kind of oversell what they actually did there, but it's interesting still to, to, to read that and believe that they actually did what they say they did. Uh, so they supported uh, a Malaysia education sector, educational sector, and then you will analyze based on the, here you can find details of this in this link. You will study the, the effects of that reform intuitively, empirically, or based on what other papers in other areas, or, or include, uh, even in that given country, uh, people have studied already. <clears throat> and you'll say what you, had, what you would have done differently, what do you propose instead, why? There is here the IMF, another example on Colombia. Uh, are you from Colombia? No. Yes? <laughs> Look at that, really. Nice. So here you can tell us actually if they really helped the tax reform in 2016. That's what they claim they did. Um, so, okay, so that's another example where you will say, okay, the reform was this and this and this, and why this reform is good or bad for medium, long-term economic growth. Or even you can talk about other things. Here you can think out of the box and say, you know what, Jorge or Turo, uh, GDP per capita is a really bad measure to, to analyze the impact of this reform, and I prefer to use this, this, and this. Uh, you will focus on inequality, social, um, um, social happiness, welfare, political stability. What, there are some measures of, uh, well, you can think out of the box, not just the typical measure that we will, will, will be studying. Okay, so here, uh, here are more details of what you have to do, and this is the list of additional institutions. Um, so uh, here you have United Nations, the Inter-American uh, Development Bank that is very, very related and linked to, to Colombia as well. I know this. Uh, Asian Development Bank, the OECD, a Bank of International Settlement, Settlements for the ones that like more finance-related uh, issues, Reserve Bank of Australia, the Treasury. And if you have another economic organization that you would like to be part of, at least in this uh, play role uh, project, you, you, you email me and let me know, okay? Is that clear? Any questions, concerns? Okay, so now, yes. The groups, so the groups, preliminary groups are already on Blackboard, uh -huh. right? But that can change because um, some people will leave and some people will uh, arrive. So when do I think this is uh, so we'll do this. So I commit to give you the final groups, not the final groups, but not modifying groups except 
adding people, not taking people, so which is certain for you, uh, by middle next week? Four or five or three? It depends on how many people are in the tutorial. You're welcome. Okay, so we go now to today's lecture. Okay, so today's lecture, uh, the the main chapter is about chapter. Uh, sorry, is the, the chapter we we are referring to is chapter four in the book, uh, the online book Garin Lester and Sims, that now we call Garin et al. Garin et al is the online book, and chapter four is the one that is related to all this. So uh, in the first half of the course, we care about long-term outcomes, as we say, we said. And we'll talk about economic development and, and economic growth interchangeably. Uh, even when they are not necessarily the same thing, we'll use that as our proxy uh, during this course. Okay? And we'll think of economic growth as the main uh, uh, driver of per capita income. It's a very simple thing, but, but uh, it's important to emphasize. Uh, the more you train, if you're an athlete, if you play soccer, the more you train, the better level you can get. The more you grow every week, every month, in terms of uh, what you're doing, the, the higher the level you will attain. So it, it's, it's very uh, straightforward and obvious, but we'll emphasize that a lot here. So before we introduce our facts, uh, I just want to give you some links uh, about what the world think about growth. So here we have um, two links that talk about short-term and long-term economic growth. Short-term economic growth is economic growth in this quarter, in the next month, in the last year, right? Short-term. That's the second part of the course. But the, the, the first part of the, the course is long-term. What is a, the average growth rate of the economy in the last decade, in the last 20, 30 years, that's our long-term measure uh, that will allow us to understand um, long-term. So economic, when I say economic growth, in this first part, we're thinking of medium long-term growth, okay? When we talk about recessions, volatility, volatility short-term uh, uh, growth, I will be explicit about that. But economic growth will be typically uh, long-term, especially in this first part of the course. So here, um, this, this is one quote from uh, the, 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 the Economist article. While long-term growth is certainly uh, an average of many years, today, now sitting now, uh, March the 1st, 2019, we don't really know whether a bad economic uh, condition will persist or not, right? So shocks or things can be very persistent. And if that is the case, then the short-term growth becomes a long-term issue, right? So that's why uh, also people care about the short-term because that can manifest or imply uh, long-term uh, problems. So this quote here about Venezuela negative growth in 2018, Gross mismanagement has led to hyperinflation and looming sovereign debt default. So what is this? And how we understand this within our framework? Uh, if you think about a company, uh, who's working in a private company now, right now? So if you, if you think about a CEO, if you are the manager, right? Two different persons will have completely different strategies, how to make people work, right? And just a change of CEO can change completely the productivity of a firm, okay? So there is a lot of evidence on that. Basically, uh, a CEO that has 10 workers and, and 10 machines, it's gonna produce 1,000, suppose, and then another CEO, CEO that is much more productive, better prepared, and can motivate people in a better way, it's gonna, it's gonna produce two times that, potentially. So that's, um, that's what here, uh, why uh, I call it this mismanagement. This is essentially thinking of the leaders of Venezuela here as a CEO, making decisions that will affect the economic situation in a given uh, firm or country. And so uh, to, to, to be on the same uh, page, uh, I don't have a, 
anything to write down here, it's okay. So, uh, as I said, I, I use the iPad and I can write whatever I want, but today Apple TV didn't work. Okay, so that will be something we'll discuss later. North Korea is also paying the price for its policies. Uh, Puerto Rico is forced to shrink by 8% in the wake of a devastating hurricane. Uh, so here, policies and mismanagement are kind of in the same package, but the hurricane is interesting. I mean, it's not interesting, it's, it's, it's devastating, it's not good, but uh, you, sh you should tell me, guys, when these things happen. Okay. Uh, so that hurricane there is, is a good example of this. Uh, it's a natural disaster that we typically macro use as, a, as a, an exogenous variation that is like a technological shock or something that destroyed capital, even destroyed labor, people died, uh, and, uh, and affects the productivity of an economy. That's like an exogenous variation that will, that will be in, our, in a term that we call A, that's going to be product, productivity. More robust and higher quality private sector investment, including tangibles and skills, is key for long-term productivity and real wage growth. Here we'll have, we'll analyze what is the effect of investment in medium and long-term growth, and you will see interesting results here, probably the ones that already studied the solo growth model. We'll realize that, uh, we'll know that investment in this type of uh, models only has a short-term effect, no long-term effect, but then when we study an uh, endogenous growth model, we'll, th we'll see something more interesting there. And uh, this is like putting everything together. Policymakers need to trigger deeper changes to their policies to catalyze investment, productivity, and real wage growth and make growth more inclusive. So here you can see that there is a combination between um, the importance of, of, of policies, the governments, the, 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 the CEO of the country, of the company, because this can, you can extrapolate this in a country, say if in Australia there are two, two firms, one mining sector, say BHP and, and Qantas. Whatever the CEOs of those two companies do will have huge impact on GDP in Australia. Of course, so, uh, management, the way you put together all your resources is super important, affects productivity. Um, at the same time, government policies, investment, and all that. So uh, what we'll try to do, we'll work in the next lectures on understanding most of the mechanism be behind these previous facts from a simple, very simple perspective. And as you know, these models will be, an abs uh, will be uh, very abstract, right? So if, if you... If you want to get to some place, if you want to go to South Bank, for example, you don't really need a very, very detailed map from here to South Bank, right? You really need to know what you, what you have to know. So in order to understand the key mechanisms behind, and why do we care about mechanisms? Because two different, completely different mechanisms can have the same effect, but they will have completely different policy implications. So that's why economists care a lot about causation, mechanism, not just about correlations that we see. The, the underlying mechanism can have completely different effects on what are the optimal policies to fix the problem. So we'll study how investment can lead to higher growth, how declines in productivity reduce growth, how increases in productivity or R&D, research and development increase growth, and how government policies can help stabilizing the economy in the short term, short term in downturns, or permanently. Okay, so this is like a, a, a preview, and now let me show you some basic facts that are all going to be connected to your project part two. In your part two of the project, which is the empirical part of the project, you will work on better understanding all the facts we'll, we're going to revise uh, today. Okay? So we'll see how has economic growth, uh, growth evolved over time, how different countries um, experience heterogeneous paths over time, and how they started in some situation and they ended up in a completely different situation due to different growth rates and at the end at different levels. And we'll see a very simple rule, which is how many years of growth how many years of high growth are required for a country to develop? 
we'll, we'll think about that as well. And then, which is what you will work in project in the project part two, is what seem to be the main determinants of economic growth. There is a huge literature here. However, as I mentioned in the introduction, modern macroeconomics cares a lot about microeconomic heterogeneity. So most of the evidence that it's out there doesn't consider that. So there's still a lot of things to understand. Let's say um, something that I'm working right now also with a, a former PhD a master's student last semester is how the network structure of a country, the fact that different industries are connected in different ways in different countries. So in some countries, there are a lot of input-output connections between firms, all is super interconnected. In other countries, it's not like that. In some countries, one industry is super dominant, in others, it's not. How that affects long-term outcomes or even inequality. So uh, that's something that is kind of new, and it's not what you will see in the papers we'll study. So there's still enough to, to discover. Um, so, we will typically take breaks because it's, it, two hours can be right. So, we'll, after 45 minutes, I will stop for, say, 10 minutes and then we we'll continue for 45 minutes. Okay? So, I will stop now for 10, 8, 10 minutes and then we will continue revising this and connecting with your project part two and motivating the rest of the course. Okay? I will pause this and we'll come back. Okay, uh, welcome back. Now, let's revise this, uh, what the data tells us. Um, this graph uh, I created using data from the Madison project. Um, we observe uh, GDP per capita in US dollars for Australia. This is very striking fact that after the World War II, there is this structural break where GDP per capita started to grow much faster in Australia. And not only in Australia, you also observe this for other uh, developed countries. Um, so what we observe here is that before 1950, the average annual growth rate in Australia was 1%, but after was 2%. So essentially doubled from 1 to 2. Uh, so, and, and this is, again, this is average. So you divide this in two periods, and what is the average growth rate? So, um, and just by growing 2%, one percentage point higher per year on average, uh, in this case, Australia um, became five times richer than in year 1934. So essentially from 10,000 US dollars per capita in 1936 or five there, right here, right? Australia then became five times richer by growing at a one percentage point more, okay? So that, that's a, that seems like small difference in growth rate, but made a huge difference in, in welfare, assuming that GDP per capita is our good measure of welfare. So that this GDP per capita was distributed relatively fair among all the Australians. Uh, so that's within country, time series heterogeneity, right? Now we see cross-country heterogeneity um, in income and growth. Here we have Australia as well in blue and the U.S. in red. You can see that you uh, were richer than the U.S. Um, here in Australia at the beginning of the sample, but then just by growing a little bit more than Australia, the U.S. now is a bit richer than Australia in terms of GDP per capita. Uh, so another thing that is interesting here is that you can see here Argentina, yellow, versus Chile. Um, Argentina was much richer than Chile in the 70s, 80s. But then after some uh, reforms in Chile, 
economic reforms. Uh, just um, let's omit the rest. It wasn't very, very <clears throat> nice in other senses, but in one sense, Chile was able to reform this, its economy and grow faster than before. And you can see now after the sample here in terms of GDP per capita, Chile is richer than Argentina, which is huge difference with respect to this uh, 70s. Okay, so in, uh, in, if we compare also Argentina and Chile with the U.S., right, and other social veterans in 80, it turns out that Argentina was 80 percent, almost 80 percent, as rich as the U.S., so very quite rich here compared to um, the U.S. But then after that, uh, not very good uh, performance in, ten, in terms of growth. Argentina is now just 30 percent as rich as the U.S. Okay. And now we're going to keep the same graph, but I will show you uh, uh, the average growth rates of these economies. So the average growth rate post-1900 uh, was 1.9 percent in the U.S. and 1.7 in Australia. So Australia started out richer than the U.S. Just by growing on average 0.2 percentage points, the U.S. indeed catch up and then became richer than Australia. So here you can see that if we believe and if we fix this as our, our parameter or our uh, metric to measure welfare, the 0.2 percent growth, higher or lower, can make a difference if it's sustained over time, right? That's why, uh, uh, to be honest, when I was uh, uh, younger, I was you, I, I was really, I was actually laughing at people in, in, in news discussing about 0.2 percent more of growth and, and, and why do we care so much about that? And indeed, there is uh, imprecision in the way we measure GDP. But suppose we measure in the right way. For me, was that's like the epsilon, the error of measurement or something. But here you can see that if that 0.2 point percent sustain over time, it can it can make a huge difference when you compare the U.S. and Australia, for example, right? Okay, here we have growth miracles and growth, and growth uh, disasters. So Singapore is an example of growth miracle. Who here is from Singapore? So uh, what Singapore did in the 60s was uh, incredible in terms of growth. You can see that in, if we think about GDP per capita as a measure of, of welfare, Singapore is, is richer than any other country in this, in this graph. Uh, you could tell me that potentially that GDP growth is not split fairly across population. I don't really know well about that. Uh, but one thing that in the project you will, should be able to tell us and to study is what are the determinants of this? So uh, where in the data you can identify something that happened that year in Singapore or in Chile that affected that. So in your, in your analysis, you will, you will compare this evolution with, uh, say, openness to trade, where the economy started to trade more or less with the other countries, so to take advantage of comparative advantage. Uh, uh, or, or, or the country open to financial markets who had more access to, to loans and to, to develop better projects, etc. So you will be able to tell me that um, in, the, in, in, the, in the project. Uh, and look at that average growth rate of almost 5% in Singapore since the 70s. That's, a, that's an interesting case. Uh, and then Venezuela is, on the other hand, the, the, the opposite. And, and Post-1970, the average growth rate of Venezuela is actually zero uh, percent. Again, as I said, when you discuss, when we, we do the part one of the project, you're free, totally free to tell me, you know what? In my opinion, Venezuela is better off than Singapore. I don't know. You might come up with some measure that is out there. But what I'm trying to say is that be open-minded. I will allow that. and. Um, I don't like to be super strict on, I like to, to hear more, okay? That might be uh, really hard to get actual accurate data on, on, to convince me on that, but I'm just, it's an example. Okay, so here, uh, there is a very simple rule to predict levels of income from a given growth rate, 
So you say, for example, if you keep growing for 30 years, no, no, if you keep growing at 2%, say, uh, on average, how many years it will take to, for your economy to double GDP or to triple GDP or to have the GDP of another given country? So the, by a very simple formula, you could say it will take 20 years if you keep like this. So this, for example, uh, my president, uh, Sebastian Piñera, when he arrived to, to the, the first uh, period, he promised us we're going to be developed in year 2013 or something like that. So he had this rule of 70 in his mind just by looking at growth rate. Right? Yeah. The rule of 72? Uh, so what is the log of 2? Do you have a calculator there? Yeah, that's why the, it, the log of 2 is the, is the answer. So it's basically from the log of 2. It's approximately 0 0.7 or 0 0.72 potentially. Uh, but it's, we'll see that now. In Anybody has a marker? So we can, we can see more in detail now. But I mean, the formula is here, but I would like to. Um, so let's, we're going to take the Australian case. Thank you very much. You can just try and throw it. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's your name? Faizana. Faizana? Faizana. I asked for a list of your names and pictures, but it doesn't exist. So I genuinely wanted to learn your names, but I will try, Andrea. OK? That was, that was a joke. I said Andrea. Faisana? Okay, that's relatively okay. Can you say my name? Can you say my name? Okay, that's good. Okay, so uh, no, before that, let me be here. Uh, as I said, I, used, I typically use the, the, the iPad. But light, light. I used the iPad, right? But now it didn't work. However, the formula is here, and you will see this in tutorials in, in great detail. But the idea is this. So we have the interest compound formula in finance. If you want to know uh, what is the value uh, of a saving or what uh, when you deposit some money at a given interest rate, how much you will have after a certain period, you, we can do exactly the same here. So GDP, this is initial GDP, GDP zero. Say today's Australia GDP per capita, 50,000 uh, 50, US dollars, US uh, dollars in, in year 2011. That is, G is the average growth rate of the economy. And T is time, right? So G is the average growth rate. And uh, T is just time. So what is this saying? Is this given G, say 2%, how many years it will take for GDP zero to become something, whatever you want? You can tell me a number, you can tell me whatever you want. But the, the idea of this uh, rule of 70 is, let's think about how many years it, ta it takes for a country to double its GDP per capita, right? So that's, that's the question. Given G, this equation will tell us how many years it takes for a country to double its GDP. So T is the unknown. So we take logs. And you will do this in tutorials, uh, but I would like to do it as well. So the, let's take these two expressions. They are multiplied. You take the log. It's just the sum of the logs, right? So you have the log of 1 plus g to the t plus the log of GDP 0. That is equal to the log of 2 plus the log of GDP 0. So now what happens is you can cancel terms, right? The log of GDP zero cancels 
with this and then we can also apply some rule of the logs here that the log of something uh, to the power of something you can bring that exponent multiplying here on front so this here is the same as t times the log of 1 plus g and that is equal to the log of 2 so anyone is familiar with this expression out here the log of 1 plus g what is that equal to equal to g that is approximately equal to g and how you obtain that you will do that in tutorials have you heard about taylor approximation first order taylor approximation so you essentially take a first order taylor approximation to the log of one plus g around the local point where g is equal to zero so when g is equal to around zero this when g is around zero up to a first order this is very close to g t times g equals so essentially approximately so uh, when we talk about growth rate g is one percent two percent three percent that's is a that's a very small number so that's that's fine when we talk about investment we know that investment fluctuates so much that sometimes can be 10 percent 20 percent and that is not then this this is not then a good approximation for investment for example I mean, if you're in Excel, you're just do log, log one plus g. Don't just use g when you are especially uh, talking about a variable that is um, very, very volatile. But but this is uh, useful for growth rates of GDP per capita because these are small numbers. So this is approximately g. Log of one plus g is approximately g when g is small. By small, we mean around zero. So now, the log of two, this is where uh, what you mentioned comes to, to play. If the log of two should be 0 0.72 potentially. That's why. But let's just approximate this. And that will be the rule of, of 70, basically. How many years, t, and I will... That is that formula. Zero point t, I just converted that into a, a, a fraction and t. So give me any g, any growth rate, say 1%. How many years it will take for a country to double its GDP? It's just replacing here this for 1. 1%, one. Say 2%, uh, uh, you put 2 and you, and you find the answer essentially. So it's, all what I did here is, is in the slide already, but I just, I forgot your name already. Thanks to you, I could, uh, uh, I could derive it here in, in lecture. Good job. Okay, so that's it. Uh, and then let's ask. At the post 1900 era. The average growth rate of Australia was 1.7%, right? Therefore, if Australia's GDP uh, keep growing at 1.7% and we use the formula, what that tells us is that Australia's GDP will double, so it will become 100,000 US dollars with base year 2011. It will double in 41 years, okay? So now here I'm asking you, what if G were, actually that's a typo, that should be 0.7%. 0 point, 0 point when I upload the, the slides, I will correct it. I mean, I will upload the corrected ones. The point I wanted to make is just by changing the growth rate by one percentage point. If rather than 1.7%, you go down to 0.7%, how many years will it take for Australia to double its GDP? And remember, that should be 0.7%, not 0.07. That will take more than, double, uh, more than two times the amount of years. So that will take 100 years. 
So this is again emphasizing the point that one percentage point of sustained growth can make can make an important difference. Do you prefer the lights like, the lights like this or like before? Who prefers the like the lights like this? Who prefers a more private situation? And the rest doesn't have any preference. Okay, so uh, one more time. Who likes the lights like this? Who likes the lights like they were before? It's like a tie, right? So I will. Did somebody count? I think it's a tie. No? Penalties. Okay, so the summary of growth facts. Um, growth rates are not constant over time. Uh, then, that's an intermediate point. There is substantial heterogeneity in countries per capita GDP. There is also heterogeneity in growth rates, and we observe growth miracles and growth uh, disasters, things that you will study in your project. Why we observe this? Why is it the case that Singapore, Venezuela, or Chile, Argentina experience this? What is the main determinant of economic growth? Okay, and, and here you can be on ideally very creative, creative, and not just look at standard things like this, for example. This is the seminal paper in the, uh, in the area by Robert Barrow. Uh, this is about uh, um, the determinants of GDP growth in a cross-section of, of countries. He studies uh, 90, 98 countries in the world in a period of time of 25 years until uh, 85, and he finds that the growth rate of per capita GDP is possibly related to the initial level of human capital. So if you, even if you give a lot of new computers or, or, or new uh, techniques to workers that have low level of education or skills, they won't be able to use it that much, right? So the initial level of human capital matters a lot for the future path of growth, and that's what he finds. He also finds that uh, there is a relationship between human capital and fertility, and that has a, a relationship with physical investment. And physical investment, he documents some weak relationship with GDP, which is going to be consistent with what we study here. Like, while GDP and investment should be related, they shouldn't be related in the long run, just in the short run. And, and lastly, what he finds very interesting is that growth rates are possibly related to measures of political stability and in, inversely related to a proxy for market distortions. And these market distortions can be great constraints that you are not allowed to, to to obtain funds to start a company, even when the idea is super good. So those are type of market frictions. This is in the, in the book we have, uh, Garin, Lester, and Sims, uh, a very, very strong relationship between, between human capital and income per, per capita. Can I have, again, the, the marker? Sorry. Uh, so the reason I want to do this is to introduce an important concept and to also uh, try to hurt you uh, with this. Thank you. Uh, so um, this is a super, super strong positive relationship. If you have an index of human capital for every single country, like this, uh, this is uh, like 100 countries, and this depends on years of schooling of a country, uh, uh, enrollment, tertiary, tertiary education, etc. And there you have the log of GDP per person. You observe this pretty nice. So you would say, look, all what we need to know is education, right? It's the main thing, you might think. This is the weak relationship I mentioned with uh, investment, but still positive, not very clear. And this is what I mentioned, uh, that what I wanted to emphasize. So, this graph, whoops, this graph shows the relationship between GDP per capita and productivity, already taking into account the role of human capital. Sorry. I will make the iPad 
work ne next time, I promise. So it's this. So let's say why, why is output or GDP in an economy without intermediate inputs? This is just GDP. And that depends on this neoclassical production function, where K is capital and H is human capital. So physical capital and human capital, right? So the graph that we previously showed, study, was like this. The relation between H and Y, and it was nicely positive. Then we show the relationship between K and and GDP, it was weakly positive, because this is like a long-term growth. But then this is showing you the relationship between GDP and th that term over there, A. What is that term over there? What is that A? Technology, right? That's a measure of technology. It's what we discussed about the CEO. Given the same amount of people with the same level of education and the same amount of computers, if I am the CEO versus you are the CEO, can be a really important difference in how much the company can produce or how much the, the, the government or the economy will produce with different presidents or something like that. So that A there is already filtering out all what comes from K and H. So if you proxy for A, and how you proxy for A, very simple. That's A. You observe GDP. You observe measures of capital and human capital. So then you can obtain a measure of A. Once you obtain that measure of A, look at that very strong relationship. That is telling us that it's not just about human capital or physical capital, but A, productivity of a country, is fundamental for uh, long-term growth or GDP per capita. Okay? Yes. Uh, in human capital, that index is a, is a combination between uh, years of schooling, enrollment in master or PhDs, uh, secondary enrollment. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's an index, it's an index. So in the, in the project, for you, what is easier for you to obtain, either of those is relatively easy to obtain from the World Bank, like years of schooling and uh, enrollment in, in, in postgraduate and something like that. So that's a proxy for human capital. It might be a really bad one, but that's what we have available here. And, and then once you control for that, then A, productivity, seems to be really important. But then what is A? What is A? So it's, it's, that's the question, right? So here, this is a paper by Hall and Jones, and what they claim that A is, is very, very related to social infrastructure. And by social infrastructure, that's another index that they construct with uh, proxies for quality of institutions, government policies that support productive activities uh, and support capital accumulation and, and skill acquisition and innovation. So they construct this index, index, which is essentially what is the quality of institutions in a country and also what is the, the, the level of distortions in a country, potentially from a market, uh, market imperfections. So once they do that, they get this index, they find this. But that index is, is essentially explaining an important part of the terminating cross-country GDP per capita, and that will be potentially very related to this. So that's what they claim. Okay? Yes? Um, so you could argue that you observe that from there if you fit a non-linear uh, relationship. Yeah, that's actually interesting. It's super steep at the beginning. And then, yeah, that's a good point. So that, uh, don't steal that idea. So you, you can use that in your project. Um, okay, what's your name? Daniel. That's easy. <laughs> right, Andrea? That's, what was your name? 
Fazana. Okay. Okay, so in the next lecture, will we be able to pronounce names better? And also... Yes, I won't need this. You don't like this game? Uh, in the next lectures, we'll be able to make sense of the previous facts using economic models. Uh, we will understand all what we discussed previously. We'll try to understand that. And that's all for today, unless you have questions or concerns or something to throw. Okay, see you next week then. Yes.